I'm really pleased that we've got Keith Burstein on the call. Keith, uh, do you want to unmute yourself? Hello. There you are. All right. Well, I can hear you. Yeah. Now, um, Keith, this is your first day that you've ever been on Zoom. Uh, yes. and I'll, I'll just introduce you as a composer and a conductor and a musical theorist. Is that is that the right term? Um, yeah, theorist? that's fair enough. Yeah. yeah. I'll just... um, and on this part of the show, we do. Um, it's like it's a bit like that program on Radio Four that I can't mention because you can get in trouble for. Um, copying it but it's where people choose their favorite pieces of music and they're supposed to go away to a, a, a castaway somewhere um now i was very keen to hear your um your choices of music because as a as a classical um conductor and composer um we've had drill music last time and i'd like to hear a bit about classical because drill was hardcore and I'm sure this is going to be hardcore classical as well. Um, can you tell us a bit about um, your first choice of music um, and what your in, your background in, in music was before you heard this piece of music? OK, sure. Yeah. Well, so my background in music is that my family were all musicians. So I was kind of born into it in that sense. Um, however, um, when I was 16, I still hadn't heard of the composer Gustav Mahler, who some of you will be familiar with already, who's a great writer of symphonies um, of German origin. He was a conductor of the, the Royal Opera in, in Vienna. Um, and when I was at school, someone gave me a free ticket to a concert, and that ticket turned out to be the BBC Symphony Orchestra and Mahler's Ninth Symphony. Um, and that did have a life changing effect on me when I heard that music, because I sort of realized for the first time, what can music actually do? You know, just because you enjoy music, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've experienced what it can really do when it's um, very powerful. And I do remember a sense of almost of shock, actually, at the end of that symphony, which was um, one of the last works that he wrote. And he never heard it. In fact, he, he died without ever having it played. Wow. Um, and it's still regarded as a kind of benchmark of the power of music to bear the soul. Right. It, well, look, I'll, 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 do you yeah. want me to, I'll play it now. If, if, if people, you, you, you think it's a good idea if people use earphones to hear it because it'd be better quality, but um, if you haven't, yeah. then just play it loud um, or put your earphones on and uh, I'm going to play Mahler's Ninth. The symphony. opening of the first. Yeah, the just opening. about three minutes. Yeah. Not the whole symphony, yeah. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no. Uh, here we go. Um...
Right now, um, we we don't normally play that much of uh, the 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 songs, but um, that was very uh, interesting uh, and very moving to hear. Uh, so, can you tell me um, when you heard after you heard the Marla, um, how did that impact on you? Did you then want to become a composer, or um, what, what was the yeah, what was I, the next I, I, step? That was the main effect. I mean, once you've realised, you know, from my point of view, I already wanted to be a composer. Once you've realised what music can do in that sense, you know, how it can deeply go into people's emotions and change the way you think and feel about the world, then you're kind of trapped. It's almost like a drug. You know, you've just, you've somehow got to hit that benchmark. So what then happened was that two things, really. One was that when I went in to study music at the Royal College of Music, I, I kind of discovered that actually the pathway of, of classical music in the 20th century had sort of left all that behind, all that sort of high romanticism and emotional power. And it had gone into a very kind of deeply pseudo-intellectual kind of wrong note music, as it's sometimes called, um, of the sort that most people have probably heard. It was a legitimate experiment, but the result was that the audience was lost, you know, because people love lush music like that. I mean, you can hear how the Mahler sounds a bit like film music. Well, that was written in 1909 or so. So he had a huge influence on all the composers who went to Hollywood and wrote film music. Um, and that's where music went, really. But in the concert hall, new classical music became very dryly intellectual and arid. Um, that was one thing that happened, and that's dominated ever since. The other thing that happened was that I was politicised by 9-11. So after 9-11, I suddenly felt myself to be a kind of political creature as well as a musical one. I was horrified by the response of the West and what happened the following 9-11, the invasion of Iraq. So now I'm kind of not only um, a radical, new tonal, new me melodious composer, who's rebelling against the atonal, intellectual sort of new music establishment, but I'm also politically conscious. And then what that led to was that a group of us got together and decided why is the BBC basically just broadcasting a certain type of new classical music that nobody likes? I mean, I would defend the freedom of anyone to write whatever they want, but this is now a political matter. Public money is being used en masse, and in a lot of it, <laughs> to support just one sort of music. There's no evidence that the public wants at all. Yeah. So, it, it, so I it's mean, not... for example, can I just say, so for example, if there's a packed uh, uh, music venue, it would be to watch an old composer, you know, like Beethoven or Mozart or, or Mahler, um, but you wouldn't see numbers of people going to see, to hear a, a, a modern, uh, eight, you know, atonal uh, composer, would you? No, and that culture really just existed purely because of subsidy. But who's deciding how that public money is being used, especially if the public who are being forced to pay it because they have to pay the license fee, otherwise they go to jail, they did in those days, um, don't even want. So what sort of perversity is that? You know, and it was beginning to raise by towards the end of the 20th century, let's say after decades of this, it was beginning to raise really a serious question. So what happened was that a group of uh, the sort of motley crew of various odd, oddballs who were sort of all agreed about there was this problem in, in for, for we composers of melodious music, we wanted to have a voice. So it was a freedom of expression moment. And we felt that there was something very wrong with the whole picture. So what we so did- you, So you went out and um, protested as we do as lefties um, <laughs> uh, in, in a concert hall. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to show what I'm going to show is a video, a short video, firstly, of, of an example of the kind of music that you were uh, protesting about and then some of the, the protests as well. So I'm just going to I'm just going to play that, uh, that now. Um, so this is. Thank 
none of it does what music used to do, which is speak to the world. It's self-denying music. Of course it speaks to the world. How could that not speak? That deals with the same themes as music is dealt with. For its whole life, it's just not tonal. It denies, you just want nice chords. It denies itself the ability very, to speak to the world. Very, very backward looking and reactionary. It's it denies itself the ability very, very, to just say only the simple dead. thing. There is there a is complacent no establishment. In the media. There is no real thing. This is the more originality. Of course there is. It's modern music without opposition. It's like governing without opposition. It's dangerous. It's fascism. Oh, the whole this is dangerous. The whole thing is fascism. Don't call it this fascism. It's <laughs> dangerous. There is, there is, Hang on. There there is a tyranny of taste in this country. Why don't no, there is not a voice of opposition. Like uh, so there, there you were, uh, a younger you, outside when, <laughs> is that the Royal Opera House. Yeah, once, yeah. yeah, outside the Royal Opera House, um, arguing, um, and then and, and inside the Royal Opera House, you you actually booed. Uh, uh, is that right? You, you were booing when it was yeah, played. Yeah, I mean, we we announced to the press beforehand that we were going to boo, and that immediately. I mean, you, you it, once amazing factor in this, all of this picture was the, the, the extent to which just going along to the Royal Opera House and telling the press we were going to do it created this storm. You know, Newsnight spent £20,000 making a film about it. They sent Jeremy Paxman along to the Royal Opera House to interview us live afterwards. Lord Gowrie, who some of you of a certain age will remember, was the arts minister for Margaret Thatcher, um, came along to sort of counter cheer and so on. I mean, he was person notorious for saying he couldn't afford to live on a cabinet minister's salary. Um, so all the great and the good rolled up to sort of counter cheer against our booing. I mean, I've got nothing against Bert Whistle or his music. You know, I have played his music, I've conducted his music. The issue here was to actually cause a bit of a rumpus and open up a debate so that the public who have to pay for this sort of new classical music were aware of it. They might disagree with what I was saying, but it was just to actually create a spotlight so that this matter came to a, a, the attention of, of the public. Oh, right, right. Now, the, the, uh, there's people saying, well, play some of your music. So what we're going to do is, um, <laughs> uh, because I, I, I think it's right that we, we know where you're coming from yeah. and then what you what you've produced, what music you've you've composed, and, and how does that come out? So um, I'm going to uh, play uh, some of your um, music now. So here we go. Right now, uh, I mean that sounds very uh, different to the Gawain um, uh, that we heard earlier. Um, now, it, 
is 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 this something that um you think can be changed the 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 way that things are because you've been campaigning on this obviously for quite a while um what what's what do you think needs to change it to make it that well, atonal music's um, not dominating first of all thank you very much for those those beautiful comments um well, actually, it's very simple. I mean, all, all that needs to change is just for the field to be opened up. And as I say, this is a sort of a political question. In, in, on the left, we, we all obviously passionately want the arts to be supported. Um, but the, the, the other side of that coin is that if you, if you support the arts and it comes from government, then that process has to be really transparent and open. And it has to be as democratic as possible so that uh, somehow there are many different people choosing how the money is spent. The problem with the system that we've had is that there's no accountability. I mean, I challenged the controller of Radio 3 once about this. And I just said, well, how do you decide what you broadcast? He said, it's just my taste. It was literally as arrogant as that. And he's even called the controller of Radio 3, like some sort of Orwellian figure from a dystopian future. Mm. Um, so it's actually, on the one hand, it's very simple is that it's just got the whole field just has to open up so that this sort of claustrophobic cabal of people who just without accountability are spending vast amounts of public money on just a kind of music that the public doesn't appear to want um, no longer exists in that form. Right. And, and the, the, the sort of the, the funding of, of music is, is, is very, it's very difficult to get funding, I, I, I imagine, in your situation, if you aren't going along with what they're looking for, this kind of atonal Absolutely. stuff. Yeah, I mean, we really were risking our whole futures and careers when we did that protest, because it is a monopoly situation of the, it was the only um, purveyor of this sort of new classical music um, as, a, as a, an idiom or form of art was the BBC, well, still is, you know, it's just, so if you go out and criticise it and, uh, you know, and protest um, at an iconic a uh, member of their community of composers and uh, who was Sir Harrison Burwistle and uh, the iconic institution of the Royal Opera House, you are really risking your whole future. I mean, I'm not boasting about the, the risk that we took, but it's true that um, on a professional level, yeah. uh, it's a huge risk to do that. Um, I mean, since then, I've actually acquired some private sponsorship, you know, just from individuals who want to sponsor my work. Um, I mean, I would love not to have to rely on that. You know, I'd love to have a government that valued the art so much that the government made sure that people who want to express themselves through being creative are all given an equal opportunity to do that. But we don't have such a government. Yeah. And uh, I mean, do, do you think that atonal uh, music that's dominating um, actually puts people off getting into music at all so i mean is that detrimental um i mean if they if they like sort of good melodies and stuff wouldn't they more young people want to play music but if they think it's just this kind of jarring stuff yeah it's not going to it's not going to um encourage people to be creative and artistic well, it's certainly a major problem to anyone who wants to go down the path of being a, co a composer of, say, concert music. So music for the concert hall or the opera house. Um, of course, many composers peeled away because it was such a hostile environment to become film composers, TV composers. And that's great if, if they want to do that. And TV and film need wonderful composers, you know, but the tragedy is if the whole classical tradition dies. And when I say the whole classical tradition dying, I do mean the whole tradition. So unless a great tradition like classical music is renewed at the fountainhead, the whole thing becomes a museum culture. So we're not just talking about here, people being discouraged to go into the profession as composers. We're talking about, because they're not doing, they're not allowed to do it. You're literally not allowed to write tunes. Um, if you are a composer nowadays, you know, you're laughed at. If you write melodious and harmonious music, you're discredited. So what happens then is that the old tradition of the old repertoire of Beethoven and Mozart and Mahler, for instance, actually becomes a kind of museum culture. So it begins to die as well. So what's at stake is the whole tradition of classical music. Now, some people may say, well, you know, tough luck, what's taken over is pop music and rock music. And that's true, the pop music and rock music, which I love, I love all music. Um, that has become really our contemporary classical music. 
and maybe that's as it should be you know not i mean you know you can't it's not preordained that classical music should forever go on being renewed and that tradition should go on being renewed but i think it can if composers such as myself not just me it's not just promotional of myself um it, it, uh, anyone who can contribute any sort of music that is both contemporary speaks to the present speaks of the future but uses melody and harmony to do it which is a universal language of music if you forbid melody and harmony then you're really spelling doom for the whole classical tradition <laughs>